Welcome to week one of our course on the Boltzmann Law, Physics to Computing. This is the third lecture. As you may recall, in the first lecture, we stated this Boltzmann Law, which gives us the probability that a system will be in a certain state, in the state space. And in the second lecture, we went a little deeper into where this law comes from. And in the process, we introduce this concept of entropy, whose derivatives give you these two parameters, mu and t, that enter the equilibrium law. Now, what we'll be doing in this lecture and the next is we'll be talking in more depth about this concept of entropy and these relations and where it all comes from. Okay. Now, as I said, to understand the Boltzmann law, we have to consider the system in equilibrium with a reservoir with which it can exchange energy and particles, this E and N. And the probability that the system will be in a state one relative to the probability it will be in state two, that ratio is equal to the ratio of the number of states of the reservoir that correspond to state one and to state two. And usually the probability of being in a lower energy state is higher because you can see this exponential. The lower the energy, the bigger the probability. And this is because again, that when the system is in a lower state, the reservoir has more and corresponding energy. And because it has more energy, there are more states of the reservoir available. And so W1 is bigger than W2. And what we showed was that this can be written as this form of an exponential, where the two parameters mu and t are related to this derivative of this entropy function to, from, with respect to energy and with respect to the number of particles. So what we'll now do is introduce a model for this reservoir and use it to calculate quantities like W, E, and N, so that we get a little more insight into these relations. Okay. So the model we introduce is, think of a reservoir that's also composed of these little two-level systems, zero and one. And there are many of them, that's the small n, and they're all non-interacting. The basic rule for the Boltzmann law that we introduced for the system, that applies to any complex system. It could be interacting, whatever it could be. Right? But right now what we are introducing is a model for the reservoir, okay. where we assume that it's many non identical non-interacting units. Okay. Now notice that I'm using this tilde, and the reason is I want to distinguish it from the probabilities, this equilibrium probabilities of the system that we had introduced earlier. You know, for the Boltzmann law, we use this p sub i to denote the probability of a system being in state i. Now, to just to distinguish from all that equilibrium probability, we are using this tilde. And of course, the reservoir could also be in equilibrium, in which case these probabilities would be given by the p's without tilde. But just to keep it general, we have the tilde. Okay. Now consider n units. So there will be 2 to the power n states. Each one could be described by a string of ones and zeros. And the number of units that will be in state 1 will be n times p1, the total number times p1. The energy will be epsilon times n times p1, where epsilon is the energy corresponding to 1 relative to the 0. Now, we write the entropy, that's this k log w, k being the Boltzmann constant, and w is the number of different states that correspond to that particular, for a given p1, the, the number of different states that correspond to it. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Supposing p1 were 1, then there's only one state that one could write down. That's all ones. Or if the p1 were 0, it would be all zeros. And so w would be 1, and so the entropy would be 0. On the other hand, 
if the probability is say 50%, 0 0.5, that means half are zero and half are one. And then you see there, there are many ways of writing that. And so there'll be lots of states, W will be a big number and the corresponding entropy would also be big. Now mathematically, I could write W as N choose NP1, because the idea is I've got N units, in how many ways can I choose NP1 units that will be one? And this is also equal to N choose NP0. In how many ways can I choose and P0 units, that will be zero. And those are actually mathematically equal. And you could write W as factorial N divided by factorial NP0 times factorial NP1. And this is this general, this is the elementary combinatorial law that you have probably seen or you could look it up easily. Okay. Now, if you take this function and plot it as a function of P1, you'll get a curve looking like this. When P1 is zero at that end, as we discussed, there is only one state possible. When P1 is one, again, only one state is possible. So at either of those ends, the entropy is zero. In the middle, when it's 0.5, that's when the entropy is a maximum. And if you plot it for different values of N, N meaning the total number of units, then this is what you get for say 20 of them, this is what you get for 40. But as you increase it more and more, it converges to a particular curve. So once you get to say 1000, it really doesn't matter whether n is 1000 or 10,000, you get much the same curve. And this curve has a maximum of log two. And actually there is a simple expression that describes this limiting curve, the one that you get when n tends to infinity. And that is this p0 log p0 plus p1 log p1. Okay. And remember, of course, the sum of p0 and p1 is equal to one. Now, so what we'll be showing is that starting from this combinatorial expression, how you get to this relatively simple expression. But before we go on, let me just mention that there is a similar expression you may have seen if you have taken a course in information theory. Because in information theory, the way you think is, supposing I send a message with n bits that looks like this, what is the information content? And there the argument is, with a combination like this, if there were, let's say, 100 possibilities, then when I send you one particular message, then the information content is like log of 100. So there, that is how you define the information content. And this entropy you see in information theory is a dimensionless number. Whereas in what we are doing, we're coming at it from the point of view of thermodynamics and the thermodynamic entropy is a dimensionful number. It's got the same units at the Boltzmann constant K. And if you Google it, you'll see lots of discussions about the relationship between the thermodynamic entropy and the information entropy. You know, some believe there is a deep relation, some don't, there's arguments about that. Okay. Now, going forwards, what I want to show now is, in the next few slides, we'll go through a little bit of algebra to show how you get from this combinatorial expression to this relatively simple expression. Uh, so the first step is you take the logarithm of both sides because you want log w, and log w is equal to log of factorial n, that's the numerator, minus the log of np0 factorial and np1 factorial because those are in the denominator. Now, next what we use is something called the Stirling's approximation which is that when n is large, remember this equivalence we are trying to prove only applies for large n. So when n is large, you can write the log of factorial n as n log n minus n. So instead of log of factorial n, we can write n log n minus n. Similarly, instead of log of np0 factorial, we can write np0 log np0 minus np0. Similarly, log of NP1 factorial becomes NP1 log NP1 minus NP1. 
right? So we are applying this Stirling's approximation to each of the three things. Now, you'll notice that what's in here, n minus np0 minus np1, that just cancels out. Why? Because remember, p0 plus p1 is equal to 1. And so we are left with the top line. Next, what we do is we expand it a little in the sense that when you have log np0, that's like log n plus log p0. Similarly, log of np1 is log n plus log p1. And so from here, we get this. We have broken up each of these two terms into these two to each. So now we have five terms there. And here again, what I'd argue is that this top line cancels out because np0 plus np1 is equal to n. So everything in that top line cancels out. And so we are now left with just this, which is what I've written here. And that's basically what we set out to prove. So that's the all the algebraic steps getting from this combinatorial expression to a relatively simpler expression on top. Okay. Now, so this is the result then when the reservoir is composed of little two-level systems, 0 and 1. Now, if the reservoir is composed of, say, D-level systems, you know, so you have lots of levels from 0 to D. D could be 10, could be 4, whatever it is. Then there would be but once again, we have small n number of units. But if you have multi-levels like this, then the generalization is instead of p0 log p0 plus p1 log p1, you get a sum over all of these. So you'll have p0 log p0 plus p1 log p1 plus p2 log p2, p3 log p3, and so on. So that's what this summation is. It says go and sum them all up. Now, so that's the expression for the entropy. In fact, that's the general expression that we are working on. Now, to complete the story, I'm also writing the expressions for the energy and the number of particles. What's the energy? Well, you have a system with many levels E sub i, and each one has a probability pi of being occupied. So the total energy is pi times ei summed over all the levels. Same for the number of particles. You can sum it up and get the number of particles. So these would be the expressions then for S, E, and N, assuming this model that the reservoir is composed of small n units of these multi-level systems. Okay. Now, here, the way we thought is there are n units, n being a large number, 1,000 of them, for example. But another way to think about it is that we got only one of them, but let's think of the time average, because that one of them will continually be jumping around with different probabilities, and you can average over time. So instead of writing the total entropy of n units, we could take this entropy per unit and think of it as the entropy of one unit, but when averaged over time. And so this is the general expression that we could use right? with interpreting S, E, and N as the entropy, the energy, and the number of particles per unit. And you could interpret this as a time average, or you could interpret it as an ensemble average, that if you had an ensemble of N, what would it be per member of the ensemble? Now we want to come back to what this concept of mu and t that I had mentioned before that, you see, when we derive this equilibrium law, if you remember, there were these two parameters, mu and t, that appeared. And they were related to this concept of entropy. That's what we had done in the last lecture. And we said that t was related to the derivative of entropy with respect to energy, where the mu over t was rela related to the derivative of s with respect to n. Now. Now what we have is an explicit expression for S, E, and N. And so we should be able to find these derivatives and in check indeed what, what temperature and what we get for mu. Because we now have introduced an explicit model for it and calculated these quantities. Now the point is that this 
these two relations, actually you could combine it and write it this way, that ds equals de over t minus mu dn over t. And this expression though, is not what you would always get in general if I use these expressions for s, e, and n. But you would get this expression if we assume that these p tildes are actually equal to p, meaning if you assume that this reservoir that we are talking about, this quant entity that we are talking about is actually in equilibrium. And which is often the case for reservoirs, but the thing is we may want to apply these expressions to other things which are out of equilibrium, which are not necessarily in equilibrium. We could still use these expressions, which is why I went to the trouble of putting a tilde on top to make it clear that the expressions we are obtaining are valid in general. But if the entity is in equilibrium so that the PIs happen to equal what you'd expect at equilibrium, then you'd have this interesting relation. Now, however, in order to show this though, we need to introduce the concept of free energy, which we'll do in the next lecture. Let me just end up this lecture then by noting that Again, first lecture we introduced this Boltzmann law. In the second lecture, we introduced this concept of entropy and now we have talked deeper, we have looked deeper into this concept of entropy and obtained these expressions. And what we'll do in the next lecture then is introduce this concept of free energy and try to explain where this relation comes from. Thank you.